I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design with a conversation about architecture. The kind of architecture that, if you're a true fan, makes your heart race. It did mine. <laughs> Wayne Turret is the force behind the Turret Collective. He and his team are reshaping New York and surrounding through the application of extraordinary architecture principles, new ideas, and a reimagined idea of what architecture is and what it can be. The work is imaginative, it's daring, and the philosophy is sustainable. Everything from reshaped inner city dwellings to a ground up passive house. Outdoor playgrounds, inside, inside living spaces, outdoors, and so much more. Wayne and I take a walk through quite a few of these projects, and if you are so inclined, you can walk through them with us. As always, check the show notes for a link to the Turret Collective, and we'll explore together. What you are going to find is that Wayne's firm takes the work extremely seriously. But in that approach, find ways to reignite the imagination through the use of materials in unexpected ways. Application of technique in a manner that is multifunctional and serves as multiplier, if you will, against other materials and techniques. Space, flow, lighting, emotion, and a clear passion for the work are evident in every detail. Can you tell I'm a fan? Because I am. And... I think if you are not already familiar with their work, by the end of this episode, you will be as well. This is Wayne Turret of the Turret Collective. I am incredibly proud of Convo by Design in year 10, and I'm equally proud of my partnership with Thermosol. They've been presenting partners of Convo by Design for three years now, and there is a certain amount of pride that comes with saying that the show is presented by the company that is the best in the world at what they do. Thermosol engineers the most exceptional smart shower products and steam shower systems worldwide for a few reasons. They were the first company to design patent the technology here in the U.S. dating back to 1958. Thermosol, a U.S. brand, a U.S. manufacturer in Round Rock, Texas, employs an engineering team that designs, tests, and continuously refines the product. Their quality control team tests every single steam generator before it departs the factory. Who else does that? Nobody. I have had the pleasure of working with some world-class designers and architects who tell me, and you probably know this, that the idea of luxury has changed and continues to change, especially when clients want a spa-like bathroom. Steam is mandatory. Or it's just not considered a, a, a luxury space. And if you want to add steam, you have one true option. It's Thermosol. And now, Thermosol, the industry leader in steam, bath equipment, and technology since 1958, is enhancing their already stellar family of products with new indoor and outdoor luxury saunas. Available in three design configurations, each sauna is handcrafted from clear western red cedar or Nordic spruce inspired by the brilliance of Northern European sauna technology and design. A luxury bathroom isn't luxury without steam. If you want luxury, you have one option. It's Thermosol. Check them out at thermosol.com and at thermosol on the socials. I have been looking forward to our conversation for a number of reasons. Um, I love your work. I love what you do. And I'm really looking forward to diving into this a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing things with, you know, with swings on the interior. I'm seeing some really interesting and unique ideas. Um, the, the dialect of the language of architecture that you speak is very intriguing to me. And I, and I, I'm loving that and I want to get into it. The first thing that I, I also love to do is to sort of look at the backstory and talk about the origin story and how you got here. And I'm curious because I've noticed some, some consistencies in how some creatives wind up doing what they do and others come at it from a completely different direction. What's, what's your story? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know how far you want me to go back. But, uh, as far as you want to go. <laughs> um, you know, I was always the kind of kid that, you know, made things, right? I'd make forts. I'd make, um, I, I once tried to invent a go-kart using a wind-up um, uh, turntable, you know, those old-fashioned things. I obviously didn't have any, any uh, engineering background because that motor was just not strong enough. Um, 
but I always invented things and I always sort of, you know, thought about how things could be better. And then um, I had an opportunity. My uncle was a, a secretary of a local carpenters union in New York City. And in high school through college summers, I was able to work as a carpenter on high rise buildings in the city. I would, I would work on the formwork for concrete. Um, and so, you know, I guess that's the beginning of, I could, I could have gone in many directions from there, I suppose. Uh, but one thing I realized when I was working on these buildings is that they were really banal, even from, you know, my point of view, and I wasn't even an architect then. And so I sort of thought to myself, I could at least do better than that. And so it sort of got me into that direction. Uh, I always had the aptitude to be an engineer is what I was told from these surveys that you take. Um, but I'm really not an engineer type. Um, and then in terms of being creative, it's sort of evolved over time. But I think in terms of, you know, where I am today, which, you know, I'm, I'm humble about it. It's, I, I don't, I don't think I'm anywhere really, but, um, my key word that I would always use is perseverance. Um, so I just kept at it. Um, I, I want to back up a second. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the formwork. Yeah. For concrete. So here's what's, here's what's really interesting to me. The formwork itself and concrete and working with concrete, it can be such a tedious process of laying out the formwork and building the formwork at the same time. Concrete is one of those things that you can do anything with it. I mean, they make boats out of concrete, which yeah. is just an unthinkable idea, right? Yeah. But the, the, what you can do with, with concrete, and I'm interested in, in your architect, engineer, not an engineer, but an architect, and this idea and I want, to, I want to tie it eventually. We're going to get to some of your projects. And I noticed that there is, in many of your projects, there's this idea, this playfulness, this, um, it's almost like, you know, I'm looking at, at an East Village duplex project with a slide, an interior slide. Right. There, uh, there are things that, that are present in your work that architecture is a serious business. And at the same time, you have an element of playfulness. You have an element of personality that I haven't really seen elsewhere. And I want to tie that back to this idea of doing forms for concrete because it can be incredibly tedious and boring at the same time. It's one of the most creative materials you could possibly use. And I'm just curious, did you, did you get anything from that or was it really just as tedious as that might sound? Uh, you know, yeah, I don't know how much I got from it in terms of it's certainly not playful, uh, it, not in a high rise building. Um, but I did learn about concrete and, um, and, and I also had a professor that was named Felix Candela, who did very thin shell concrete structures is from Mexico. And so uh, concrete is really like a plastic substance. You can mold it and make it into all sorts of things. And, you know, I have done sculptures like uh, plaster Paris sculptures when you dig into the beach, into the sand, and you make all sorts of tunnels and shapes, and then you pour the plaster Paris. It's sort of like concrete in a way, right? And then you dig it out when it's hardened, and it's incredible. The shapes are just amazing. Um, but, you know, when you say it's slow and tedious, it's not in high-rise buildings. We, we actually built two and a half floors a week. Um, it was crazy. Uh, the schedules are really tight. And I would be walking up on semi-wet concrete to start erecting the next forms. I would leave footprints. Um, that's how much they push in high-rise construction. Um, and they put a lot of accelerators into the concrete. Concrete gets super hot. When you strip off the forms, you could almost burn yourself on the concrete. Uh, that's how crazy it is. Um, but I do like concrete, although I like it less now because it's not as much of a green material. Um, concrete is 
pretty uh, energy intensive and, uh, um, but it's a really good material though. You can't, you can't not use it. Well, let's, it's interesting because let's, let's just sort of talk about that for a minute because you're, 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 it's so funny when we started talking about sustainability and design, everything was green, green, this green, that, and, right. and then there was green fatigue and we got tired of talking about green and, <laughs> and the idea of green is like, Oh, please. But the principles are, are what's important. And the principles are really the same and sustainable building and sustainable design. I feel like what we're, what's happening now is like this confluence of sustainable design is, is starting to hit its stride. And you've got this renaissance in design and architecture in a post-pandemic world where people realized that function is as important as form. Because I, I feel like many for a while, you know, put form in, in front of function. And mm -hmm. then we realized what form is without function. And it's like, whoa, whoa wait a minute, we got to take a step back here. And so we're at this crossroads right now where you've got function and form meeting purpose and sustainable design. This is something that you've been doing for a very long time. Do you feel like, like you just want to kind of welcome everyone else to the party? You know, uh, yeah, I have been doing it for a while, but I have to say that <clears throat> I've been doing it for a while, but not at the same intensity that I am now. So back, um, oh, I don't know, it goes back over 20 years, I did the offices for Tommy Boy Music. And that's kind of when I first started getting into it kind of seriously. Um, before that, I don't know if you know about this whole earth catalog. Um, Stuart Brand put out this thing before the internet. We had this thing called the whole earth catalog and it gave you access to all sorts of tools and ideas. People were into sustainability, you know, way back. And, you know, the seventies were, you know, a place where Stuart Brand put it all together. And especially with the gas crisis and the energy crisis, um, you know, architects started getting really creative about saving energy and solar energy and all that stuff. But uh, for me, Tommy Boy, the owner of Tommy Boy, Tom Silverman, uh, was really into it. And he was um, really into Rocky Mountain Institute and so he started me kind of going on the path of finding materials that don't outgas and, you know, how can we save energy and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so it started there for me as a, in, in my practice. But, you know, you can't practice it in a vacuum because you have clients and you can't always convince clients to do the right thing. Um, and so I've, I've evolved a philosophy of uh, if you can't do the whole nine yards, do something, do anything, uh, to, it'll help. It'd be better if you did everything, but you can't get clients to do that all the time because they're always looking at the bottom line and they'd rather put the money towards their, you know, marble bathroom or something like that rather than, you know, uh, more insulation. Um, but it's you, it's easier now than it ever has been. You you know what's kind of funny, um, when is just now you yeah. sounded you sounded kind of like an engineer. <laughs> 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 so it's it's funny. Um, my son is is in, is studying to be an engineer. He's in college right now. He's in his sophomore year, and every time he comes home, we have these conversations because I'm a I'm a tinkerer as, uh -huh. as well. Um, yeah. And when, when you say concrete gets hot, I'm well aware. Um, same with plaster. You know, when you start messing with plaster and, and it's, it's curing, it gets hot. And these are lessons that you kind of learn along the way. And <laughs> what greater lesson is there than if something burns you, don't touch it, right? Right. At the same time, the lessons that you're employing, I, I, this philosophy that you're that you're talking that you're espousing is is it makes a lot of sense because, you know, we can't do everything all at once. And if you did, you know, you would have to go through this breakage process where projects just wouldn't 
you can't do everything at once. You have to do things in small steps, even though there's this clamoring for do more, faster, quicker, now, and you can't always do that. Talk to me about that process a little bit for you. And I would imagine that within that process itself, there's a lot of experimentation. I've, I've said this for, for years now. I, I envision designers, architects, creatives to be futurists insofar as you don't necessarily think about, you don't build a project that's going to live its entire lifespan for a year or five years. You're designing something for 50, 75, 100, 200 years. Right. Um, designers are looking at a project that, you know, when they're designing it, they're designing it for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, you're not designing something. That's why the, 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 the trendy lists um, here's what, you know, here are the top 10 kitchen trends that are going to be out next year. It's like, that's just ridiculous. I've, I've always felt that's ridiculous, but the process that you employ where you're, you're building no pun intended, but you're building incrementally onto this idea and this philosophy, how does that work for you? What's your process of, of doing that? And how do you envision that? How do you think it through? Hmm. Well, I, I think I, I get what you're talking about, but so, so one example I could give you is that I built a house for myself recently uh, at the eastern end of Long Island. And um, in that house, I tried all sorts of things using myself as the guinea pig. So, you know, all the Wi-Fi gizmos you can possibly think of, you know, I employed it just so that I can experience it before I even talk to a client about it. Um, and so, you know, those things are, you know, easy, they're plug and play kind of things. I think what you might be talking about is um, how, do I, how do we advance our buildings and our projects to be more than what it, was 50 years ago in terms of, you know, building with studs and, um, and sheetrock. Yeah. So I, I'm intrigued about trying to push the envelope. Um, it's, it's slow going, I have to say. Um, so like parametric design or some of these really amazing organic structures that I, you know, you see in magazines. I am not at that point yet when, it, when we can do that. Uh, I'm also not at the point where I understand it to the degree that I'd want to do it. But um, I think if anything, my overall sense of design has to do with simplicity. Trying to keep it simple so that, you know, you can experience the space as opposed to um, kind of being overwhelmed by it. I don't, I don't that, know if that answers. I don't know if that well, answers. look, it's a, it's a, it's a convoluted question. Um, I, years ago, I was watching this video on YouTube. I wound up doing an episode about it. It was, it was produced by Westinghouse and it was the, the home of the future. The perfect yeah, electric right. home. I don't know if you ever saw it. It was hosted by Betty Furness. Um, it was a. It was. It was transformational in thought for me, because mm -hmm. um, feeling the way that I do about design and architecture, and watching something that was produced in the late fifties, early sixties by Westinghouse. In essence, it was a commercial because yeah. you have an electric manufacturer, a company that specializes in electricity, talking about the, the whole electric home. But the manner in which they produced this, it was the first um, content that I remember seeing, which presented these new ideas as if this, if you don't do this, you will be left behind. It was the first time that I really watched something and thought, wow, they are employing FOMO before FOMO was a thing, right? right? And as they went through it, it was down. I mean, it was down to like the everything you would expect from the 50s and 60s. It was like, and the woman of the house is going to love this all electric kitchen. Right. Right. The man of the house is going to love. 
uh, that aside, the misogynistic stuff aside, what they were talking about, an in-home weather station, basically a, a ring doorbell before ring, you know, where yeah, someone rings right. the doorbell and there they are on camera. That right. was unheard of in the 60s. That was Jetson's yeah. level stuff in the right. 60s, right? And it was everything that what they did is they encapsulated and enveloped an entire project using one basic idea and they simplified something that was so complicated. And I think that's what I love so much about it. And I was thinking about this in advance of, our conversation, yours and mine, because, and I'm, I've been looking at your work, you know, between the residential and the commercial and the hospitality, I find that same level of sophisticated simplicity in, in your work. And I'm curious if, if you, if your design ethos was like that from the beginning, or if it's something that, I mean, we all develop as, as creators as we go, right? But is that something that was there at the beginning or something that you learned along the way? And was there, was there a moment? So um, the Westinghouse thing you brought up was really interesting to me because uh, I have to say that I spent many days at the 64 World's Fair. And I have to say that the whole idea of newness and the future was everywhere there. And I have to, and, and it, it influenced me a lot. So it's sort of, I have to say it probably did influence me over time for sure. Um, but, you know, at the same time, is it sustainable? And uh, here, actually, this is one of the things that went through my mind as you were talking, is the idea that I don't want my projects to feel dated when 20, 30 years from now. Like, for instance, uh, 50s modern. It, it still, it feels like 50s modern. It's not, I mean, we're using it today as a design element, but it is retro. Um, I don't think there's any way to future-proof anyone's work. Um, but if there's any way to do it, I would try to do it. And I'd like to try to do it. Sometimes um, I read too much into things, granted. But sometimes, you know, it's, it's actually something, there is something there, there. Uh, and I'm curious, when you say 50s modern, are, are you, is mid-century modern and 50s modern one and the same to you same thing, same thing yeah okay so it's funny i have a friend who is so adamantly against the term mid-century modern that i mean every time i bring it up he's is there what is the reason behind that for you you mean reason why i didn't say mid-century no i'm just curious is there is it a difference without distinction or is it there's a reason because mid-century modern is is almost like a misnomer or an oxymoron. Yeah, I guess mid-century modern is an easy way to sort of, you know, uh, encapsulate all the different styles from Eames and, but I don't know. I said 50s, I could have said 60s modern. Um, basically, all I was trying to say was that uh, those looks today look like they were in the past. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. So let me ask you something. When you... When take two projects and the ideas behind them, not a project in particular, but just the ideas behind them, a residential mm -hmm. or a hospitality. I feel like in general, the, the idea of those, the, the hotel, you know, hospitality and residential used to be very, very different mm -hmm. in nature. They seem, the lines seem to be blending and bending and, and merging and I'm I'm curious because you've got so much experience in on both sides of that equation. Are they blending? Are they is has that in a post pandemic? Are we going to be talking about that as a as a as a marker, a distinction between those two ideas? Did it start for you before that? Did it is it, am I completely off base? No, no. 
but but I find it's interesting because they they sort of um, they feed on each other. So, for instance, in a, a number of residential projects I've done, um, it comes up often that the master bedroom needs to have a small refrigerator and a microwave. And, you know, they need to be able to get their water at night and popcorn. So where does that come from? Well, they're high powered individuals. They fly a lot and they stay at hotels. And so they're essentially recreating a hotel room. So that's an interesting data point for me because it's kind of like, but this is your house, not your hotel. Um, on the other hand, um, when I do residential, um, like our name says, we're very collaborative. And my goal is to basically work with the owner to the point where when the project's finished and I'm not around and they have their friends over, they basically say they, they did their project. <laughs> it's their design. And I'm okay with that, you know, because I, I want them to inform the design. But when I do commercial projects, I feel like I have the ability now to sort of just put something out there that could be pretty radical. Uh, I don't have to talk to the owners. Uh, they may not accept it, but um, it's a different kind of work because the, the ownership for a commercial project is more divorced from the end result. It's, it's a project for them, not a home. So I feel like it's, I work differently with different types of projects and retail, especially. What about retail? So retail, you know, I feel retail is one of those things where it's transient. It's not going to be there forever. So let's go really bold. Let's make a bold statement. Let's do weird things. Let's, let's just try everything. Um, and I like that. It gives me a lot of freedom. Have you, have you noticed a, a, a more of an experimental nature on the residential side in the last couple of years? Um, in, in the same way that you, that you talk about retail. Yeah, no, I, I've had a couple of projects, as you've noted, like the interior slide, the swing and things like that, where I can pull out the playfulness uh, of the client and then put it into three dimensions. Uh, but in general, clients aren't there. No, I feel <laughs> I feel like clients are pretty conservative when it comes to their home because they don't want to experiment too much because they don't want to have to re redo it. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Um, I get that. I get that. But I think it, what I'm referencing is, you know, and I hate calling it post pandemic because, you know, it, it sounds so, so Blade Runner, but um, you know, like this dystopian idea right. of, of what architecture has become. I, but I think that some really interesting ideas have come out of it. And I'm just, as I'm thinking through it, when I think of, you know, retail, design, I feel like uh, in residential, because so many people are now traveling again, and because certain things have become so important to them that they're looking for ways to display their experiences. Where in the past, maybe it was like, yeah, we'll put it in a cabinet and bring it out when we have company or something. But now it's like, I want to, I want to experience it all the time. That being said, talking about that experience, I, I want to go through a couple of projects with you and ask about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the ideas and the level of difficulty and the the why behind certain things and i'm de i'm going to start with the east village duplex and i'm um, going to start uh -huh. i'm going to start with the slide because you know it's interesting a year ago i heard about a um, you know a tech billionaire who had a slide installed but no stairs so you know there was like <laughs> you had to take the slide down i think there was an elevator somewhere but there were no stairs so it's like if you wanted down and you wanted down now you kind of had to do it which is an interesting idea. Tell me about the origin of the slide, where it came from, why, and what it was like to put this in. So the, you know, the client was a young guy 
was, it wasn't a couple, it was just a guy. And he, what he did was um, internet gambling. And, you know, so he was a fun kind of guy. He mostly worked in the day in a dark room. And um, anyway, he had a whole different way of looking at things. His whole lifestyle was just, um, just so different than mine. And so we were able to, um, we were able to just brainstorm. It's like, we got a duplex here. It wasn't originally set up as a duplex. Um, and so we need to put in a stair, right? But maybe you, maybe you want to have some more fun. And so we, we sort of put out things like a fireman's pole or, you know, or a slide or, you know, so, um, and this is what I'm talking about, where we work collaboratively with people. Um, so I didn't force a slide on him. I sort of gently suggested things. Um, and he played with it too. So he suggested things back. Um, the slide itself, we then, once we got into it, we sort of said, oh, so now where do we get a slide like this? And so we did research to different playground companies. I forgot exactly who made this slide, but it's a stainless steel slide. Um, and we gave them the you know, dimensions and where it should, um, how it should curve. And it ended up sort of you come down from the second floor and you end up right in front of the TV in the living room. Um, and I, I actually used the slide myself and you really need a cushion at the end because you really come off pretty quick. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, by the way, someone, he had to sell the apartment because somehow internet gambling was outlawed in the States. So he had to move to Canada and uh, the new guy just got rid of the slide. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and on the internet, there were all sorts of people like booing them for getting rid of the slide. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, otherwise it was a pretty simple apartment. He had one room, one of the bedrooms he turned into a game room with like pinball machines and stuff. What so, a fun pad. What an absolutely fun, total bachelor pad. That's exactly right. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And yeah, boo for taking out the slide. I'm not a fan. Not a fan. Not a fan. You are listening to my conversation with Wayne Turret. We'll be right back. Design Hardware's newly remodeled showroom is where you will find a gallery style space with a thoughtful display of products purposefully positioned to allow unbridled exploration and discovery. High end faucets, luxury tile, natural stone, wood floors, and bespoke hardware selections are presented in a holistic manner, strategically arranged to stimulate creativity and transition your vision from the conceptual stage to a fully realized space. Conveniently located, free parking available, stop by to find your inspiration, collect samples, get expert advice, and tackle everything on your shopping list all in one place. Visit them online at designhardware.com or in the real world, 6053 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. Convo by Design is more than just a podcast. I'm not sure if you know that. I have spent the past 10 years building a production company and consulting firm that develops brand ambassador programs, CEUs, live event programming, as well as branded content for companies in the design and architecture industry, including designers, architects, furnishing companies, showrooms, and others in the trade. We have content producer talent in every region of the country and can help you grow your design business through brand development campaigns, social media, and CEU content development and production, as well as content consulting and live event programming to help you build strong and meaningful partnerships that will help you grow and strengthen your design business. For more information, message me at Convo by Design with an X on Instagram or email me Convo by design at outlook.com. C O N V O B Y D E S I G N at outlook.com. Jumping, jumping from that over to West 77th Street and the townhouse. Right. So here's here's what I find so interesting. It's it's not it's not the complete opposite of what we just talked about. But it is very, very different. There's a there's a certain level of warmth to this. At the same time, you've got what a twenty foot tall media screen 
in this thing. There are huge windows. There's there's a, a modernity to it, it, certainly. But there's also, you know, in the sink, um, the the wooden nature of of much of the the interior the the furnishings and how they're laid out there's a there's a warmth to this that is it's very different but certain ideas still remain the same there seems like a blend to this what was the what was the idea behind the design right so you know we do a lot of townhouses in new york city so you know townhouses in new york city are very different than townhouses out of new york city they're attached side to side, just like in a, you know, in like New Haven or someplace that has, you know, townhouses. But in New York City, they're actually buildings. They're heavy duty, they're brick, they're masonry, they're five stories, and they're really hemmed in. So the thing that we do often in townhouses is we work hard to try to get light into the interior of the place. Thus, the reason for all the big glass in the back. And uh, in this particular townhouse, we, op- we, we designed the rear wall on the ground floor to kind of really open up. So the backyard and the living room are sort of part of the same. Um, the thing about this townhouse is the client uh, and the clients, they're, they're a couple. And they were just really good participants in the design process. So like, for instance, I think sometimes we work with people and, you know, we're architects so that they kind of feel intimidated to sort of, you know, give us different ideas that, you know, might go against ours or whatever. But, you know, I try to keep that so that it doesn't happen. In this case, they were really good participants. And so he's a a multimedia guy. And Thus, he wanted a really big screen. So we designed it so he could have a really big screen. And and she had this idea that in the elevator, we can put in, you know, I said we could put in a glass panel in the back wall of the elevator. And then she had a muralist do a weird, very strange um, mural going vertically in the elevator shaft. So as you're in the elevator, you're looking at the shaft, but you're looking at this mural as you go up and down. It's, it was really a lot of fun to work with them. Um, you know, on the other hand, townhouses are buildings and they're expensive and you don't want to do, they don't want to do really radical things like, you know, um, and, and also in New York City in places like that, they're in landmark districts and we can't do too much to the exterior. Uh, but we could play around in the interior. And for us, um, we look at the section of a building as a place that has a lot of opportunity. So for instance, in the living room, you could see that we cut out the second floor above the living room and made a double height space. Uh, so things like that, it's, you, you have to look for opportunities where you can find them in a building that's already set up. If you're designing it from scratch, you have more opportunities. But in a building like that, and, you know, when we do these townhouses, we basically dismantle them and build them back again. Um, Well, and I was noticing one of the things I was going to ask you about is if you changed, modified the interior architecture. uh, Because when I'm looking at the, the kitchen and then the dining area, really interesting here, too, to me, is... The and, and by the way, I always have to say <coughs> for those listening, um, if you go to the show notes, there are links to uh, the Turret Collaborative website under projects. You can, you know, I'm I'm listing out which projects we're we're talking about, and you can go. and I encourage you. I've gotten some great feedback from folks who are like, "This is really fun being able to listen to a walkthrough." And go look at the pictures as well. It's a really good experience, and I encourage you to go do this. Um, okay. So that being said, as I'm looking at the kitchen, which appears to be well inset uh, in in the interior, it's a lower 
ceiling height in the kitchen, which is a which is a bright white, and you've got a you've got a dining area there too, and that it opens to a a darker, moodier space, except for the fireplace wall, which which is white as well. But then it, the expanse it just completely opens up. You're right. And I think I'm trying to imagine what that must feel like walking into it. And I, I think it would probably be just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We, we like to contrast ceiling heights uh, because, you know, a lower ceiling height you enter into really emphasizes a even a small, smaller, uh, even even a slight rise gets a big appreciation when you enter in, in a lower height and you go into a taller height uh, space. And then sometimes when we're in low height spaces in New York City, which you find a lot in apartments and things like that, we use a highly reflective uh, ceiling paint. So, you know, it really tends to lift the apartment. Um, even though you're not physically lifting the height, you're able to see things like the windows are going up into the ceiling. It changes your perspective of the space completely. Can I ask you a preference question? And I'm sorry, this is this is a very very pedestrian question, uh, but sure. but I I'm curious um, in the idea behind it. So, and it's more of a design question too. Uh, so when you say a highly reflective on the ceiling, I love that. Um, especially because it will bounce the light mm -hmm. and, and really move it around. Um, and, and in a tighter space, it really does open it up. I'm just curious, it, because a lot of the apartments are older, if you do that, are you taking the ceilings down and re-drywalling so that you don't have any of the, the original imperfections in the ceiling? Or is it kind of like a wabi-sabi thing where it's like, you know what, those are the original ceilings. And even though we're putting a reflective on there, you're going to see every imperfection. We want to leave that in there. What's, it's a preference question, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it depends on who does it, I suppose. Uh, but we've had it in in places where they have worked on that ceiling for weeks using colored plaster and like eight foot long uh, screeds to get this thing as smooth as can be. Um, we try not to add to the you know, ceiling so that we don't you know, decrease the height of the space. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a project now where, you know, and it's a very, very expensive location and an expensive building, but the ceiling heights are max eight. And so that's disappointing. Um, it's hard to work with, but this reflective ceiling will help. Um, so, but, you know, the idea is to get it as flat as you can. And I'm, I, I just, you know, it makes me think too, working with older buildings, you know, a lot of people are gonna, they see that certain charm in the older buildings. And that's just something that exists. Just curious. I, the other thing I wanted to ask you about with this project is I'm trying to count the steam showers in, in this, and that is definitely part of the experience, but in, in one room, it, it almost, I don't know if it's a guest room or a den, but it appears and correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears to me that you've got a, you've got a steam shower. I'm assuming it's a steam shower. Cause I, I think I see a, a transom next to a, um, <clears throat> next to a sauna with with a, a glass front in part of a residential space not you know incorporated into a bathroom per se but i just love how this feels yeah what, yeah. what was the origin of this space because you've got the fireplace you've got the art you've got a rug i mean it's it's cozy it's well lit but it just it just looks it looks like i want to be there i wish i was hanging yeah. out there right now but this also reminds me of kind of like that blend that we talk about between hospitality and residential. Right, right. That, that, you know, I meant to bring that up when you were talking about the residential and hospitality, because you're right. I mean, you could easily see something like this in a hotel. Um, and on the other hand, it seems very residential. But the idea is that it's a hammam. It's, it's a place to, for well-being. It's a place for you to just sit and chill. Um, and you could take a sauna and then you could take a shower and then you could sit in front of the fireplace. Um, not everybody has the luxury of a room that you can dedicate to that. 
uh, but we were lucky in this case. It was, it really worked out well. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. Um, I think this project was um, really, really amazing. Um, moving, moving over to, let's see, which one did I want to go to and ask you about next? I wanted to ask you specifically about the Greenport Passive House. Uh-huh. Um, did, this, did this test you? Did this, did this test all your knowledge and skill? Did this, did this one make you work? Well, uh, this was a great learning example. Um, and I like this because I was learning. And, you know, so the idea of passive house always intrigued me. But um, I don't know how many years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, I ended up at a friend's house in Berlin, uh, an architect who built his own house. It was a townhouse, but I had only heard of passive house. And I always assumed passive house was this kind of box with tiny windows and a lot of thick walls. And I was in this house and it was a passive house. It was like, it was a, it was an eye opener because there were huge windows, super comfortable. And so I really thought, wow, this is something I really want to get into. So in this passive house is my own house. Okay. So this is where I got to experiment for myself. So the, the reason why I think Passive House is so good, and it's a stupid name, by the way. Um, you know, I, no, no lay person would think that this is a good name. Um, and I don't even know where it comes from. I, I explain it in that passive means passive heat from the sun. But, um, but I don't even know if I'm right about that. The, but the idea of Passive House is it's super simple. It's like, compare it to lead. And it's like, this is like kindergarten passive house. Lead is like graduate school. Um, there's just like five principles to make a passive house. You know, it's like air tightness, insulation, prevent thermal bridging, um, put in an ERV for fresh air and uh, site it so that it's the south facing and you can get sun in the winter and block sun in the summer. So it's just those principles are so simple. I thought, okay, um, with the help of a passive house consultant who can do all the calculations, I wanted to try it. And I'm not disappointed. Um, the weak spot is in the construction in that contractors are used to doing things the way they always did. And you know, when you're not looking, they're doing, they're basically going back to what they always did. Um, and so you got to be diligent on it and you got to find a contractors that really are into the same thing that you are. Um, but it was, it was a good experience. I ended up though doing more than I thought because I couldn't really find a contractor that kind of can carry this through. So I became the construction manager. And because I had construction experience previously, uh, it wasn't unfamiliar to me, but I couldn't be there all the time. So, how did you like? Uh, how did you like being the project manager on that? You know, I have always wanted to do design build, uh, okay. and we've done a couple projects to design build. But um, you know, you need a lot more infrastructure to do it commercially. Uh, but I always thought that that was the best way to go about building projects and designing projects was combining the build and the architecture in one. So I liked it a lot. Moving over to what I'm going to call a hybrid um, between residential and hospitality, because I'm fascinated by this particular project of yours. I, I, I love it is the Leonard Street multifamily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Take me through the origin of this. I want to I, I want to dive a little deeper into this particular project because there's so much to enjoy. And again, if you're listening to the podcast um, audio only, I, I highly encourage you to go to the website, check the show notes uh, for a link to this, and and walk through it with us because this one's super fun. It's it's fun. It's 
It's whimsical. This is, again, this is one of those examples where as I was looking through this, the playfulness in this project really comes out both to me in the design and the architecture. So take me through this project. Right, right. So the project is a, um, a young couple uh, that we did a townhouse for previously. And they basically found this property. It was two one-story garages. So technically speaking, was, this was a renovation, but essentially it, it was a new building. Um, and in this building, um, again, light played an important part. So if you look at the facade, you'll see that the whole facade from left to right is all windows. But some of the windows are normal looking windows where they're clear and you can see through them. And some of the windows are channel glass, which are these vertical tubes of glass, which allow light to come in as well. So, you know, in, in New York City, to me, light is super important because you could find yourself in apartments in New York City and canyons. It's super dark and depressing. So um, light's important. Um, and what we had, the unique parts about this project were that we were able to put in five parking spaces within it. Now, getting a parking space in New York City inside a building is not easy. I mean, from a regulation perspective. So we had to work really hard at that. And, to, and four of the cars are sort of on lifts. So they go into the, into the garage and they drop down into the cellar. Um, the, some of the photos you see there are of a triplex that we did for the owners. So, and I'm not sure which photos you have there, but you might see one with a motorcycle on an angle. Uh, are there any there? Um, so that was the owner's triplex. And the triplex starts in the cellar where we gave them a lap pool. I was going to ask about that. Okay. <laughs> it, it starts in the cellar, a lap pool and a gym. And they were always big into pools because we did a townhouse for them previously. Now this townhouse we did previously was over 10,000 square feet. And it was two buildings. It was a two story building on a corner. And then we built a new six story building. And on the top floor, we put in a stainless steel lap pool. So that's what they're, they're, they're coming from that. So that when we were when we were designing this, we designed the lap pool in the cellar, and then we put in the stairs. And um, the living room floor is also a lot of fun. Um, you may not have a picture of it, but there's a half basketball court. I don't. That's pretty amazing. How high is the ceiling? So there, the ceiling is. I have to say, it's probably 15 feet um, or higher. Uh, but uh, they don't really hit the ceiling with the basketball. Um, th they did have, we did have problems with uh, the noise transmission of playing basketball sure. to the third floor. <laughs> um, and they have an out, they have a couple of outdoor spaces. Um, so am I it, looking, am I looking at an atrium where the ping pong table is? No, that's a backyard, I think. Okay. All right. It just looks like an atrium because, you know, it's really hemmed in there. Yeah. And New York City's backyards are really small. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's uh, I believe that's an outdoor ping pong table. Um, it's it was an interesting project. Um, you know, there were the, the, all the all the problems that you typically have between getting neighbors to not call the Department of Buildings and finding contaminated soil and water. And it was, it was a full-throated New York City project. Um, question for you. In what appears to be the office, I'm looking at the floor. Is, is that a skylight down to a lower floor? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. It, and, and we do that a lot where we use these uh, structural glass skylights. So they're walkable. Um, we've done that in a lot of our townhouses. We tend to dig out the backyards, maybe 40 feet. And we put in a whole room under there with walkable skylights above. Uh, so the backyard is still walkable and the cellar gets uh, light from the sun. Is this in, I'm not sure what room this is. There's a skateboard. There's a sculpture with a dog. There's a motorcycle on a ramp. Yeah. So that's really the, uh, it's like the end of the kitchen dining room and beginning of the uh, living room. It's uh, think of it as um, it's kind of like this, this is the kitchen dining room and then this is the living room. So you're looking at where the two, fingers me is that a, is that an actual motorcycle or is it a sculpture no it's an actual motorcycle it's rideable a cafe racer it's apparently rideable but yeah okay yeah. love it <laughs> and that was again that was a collaboration between the owner and us there happens to be in that underneath that angle happens to be a stair going to the cellar an egress stair Opposite uh, one of the bathrooms, opposite the tub, I'm seeing steam shower again, but I'm curious, am I seeing two next to each other? No, one's a toilet. Oh, okay. So one's a water closet with the same, with the, the same transom and the same glass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Was that just a... Is that a is that a design detail? Was that a request from the client? Because I, there's another similar glass enclosed water closet in another bathroom. Yeah. So a lot of people like to enclose the water closet, but rather than enclose it with walls and then make the shower its own thing, it's it's it seems nice to make it completely one thing. Yeah. Um, what a great what a great idea. What a great idea. And that it's, it's interesting too, because the, the dining room table, it, it, it almost looks conference room like to me, uh -huh. but so, but so comfortable. Um, and you're looking out into is, is that's yard as well. I'm assuming it, there's. Yeah. That's the, one of the other yards. There's two on the ground floor and, a large terrace on the floor above. I really do love this project. Thank you very much. Absolutely love it. Um, we were talking a little bit about the idea of blending residential and hospitality. And I wanted your take on, with, with so much hotel experience, just the idea um, you know, because I talk to a lot of creatives who who would love to work on a on a hotel project. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> right. It it could be dicey. I mean, mostly because hotels, you know, unless you're really like in the upper echelon of hotels, and even then, and probably their budgets are tight. But budgets get pretty tight on a lot of these hotels especially they're trying new concepts. And so they're often purchasing furniture from China and, you know, they're just trying to, what's the best way to say this? They're trying to get the most for the least. Yeah. Most, most efficient. Um, it, it almost sounds like because it's, it's transactional more than passionate. Right. You know, there's a lot more of that type of thing that you have to deal with. Um, right. And it almost seems like it would take take away a little bit of the of the joy, unless it's something like a boutique hotel, and you're dealing with people who are as passionate about that as they would be a residential project. Right, but keep in mind, I mean, when you design a hotel, you're designing it for someone who's going to stay one, two, three days, maybe. Yeah. Not not two weeks, yeah. two months, and you know, six months. And so, the idea is that it needs to look good when you open the door and it needs to function enough for a few days. But if you were to try to live in these hotel rooms, you would probably get pretty frustrated. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. Wayne, uh, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the time today. This is thank you for walking me through some of your extraordinary projects. And I love your story and um, love your work. I, I appreciate the time. Well, thanks. Thanks, Josh. I really enjoyed this. We are living in a time of incredible growth, both technologically and creatively, with respect to interior design, exterior design, and architecture. There is no question. There are companies thinking differently about the business of design and how to make products super serve those for whom they're being made. One of those companies, and one of my favorites, is Moya Living, designer and fabricators of some of the most stunningly beautiful, incredibly durable, and highly functional kitchen, bath, and outdoor kitchen cabinetry on the market today. Powder-coated steel with stunning lines, vibrant colors, to fit any design style or aesthetic. A history of designing cabinetry for the scientific community. So you know it's been tested in some of the truly the most harsh conditions available. Moya O'Neill is the CEO and founder of Moya Living. She's the inspiration behind the design. Designers, their specification process is so simple. It will make your job so much easier. Check them out online through the socials at Moya Living their website, moyaliving.com, and in the real world, their live kitchen showroom in Fountain Valley, California. Thank you, Wayne, for the time. Thank you, Compo by Design partners and sponsors, Thermosol, Moya Living, and Design Hardware for your continuous support and partnership. Thank you for taking the time to subscribe, download, and listen to the show. I appreciate you very much. Now more than ever, remember why you do what you do and for whom you do it. The design and architecture community single-handedly makes better the lives of those we serve. And it's because of you. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another story. So until then, be well and take today first. 